you for that. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We've been there before. In fact, I looked back in my notes. We were preaching through this as we were going through 1 Corinthians, and I told you at the time, because at that time our deacons were reaching out uh, to this one that we're going to show biblical love to. We've been showing biblical love. We'll show you from the scriptures what that looks like. We're going to try to do that today and next Sunday as you pray, as we become uh, up to speed. Some of you have not been here through the years when we have had to come to this place. But it's important that we put a biblical context into this. And the good news is that our Constitution and Bylaws has an excellent section on this. And when we adopted that unanimously several years ago, uh, we encouraged you before we voted on it to read through it so you could vote intelligently. Anyone who is who has joined our congregation since the adoption of that Constitution and Bylaws has come uh, verbally uh, with a substantial agreement with its contents. And so again, we can't sit next to you and make you read it, but by voting for it, by agreeing to come into our congregation, you have basically said to us, we have read it, we agree with it. I'm gonna be drawing from it today. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter five I want to read verses 1 to 13. It's that passage about the immorality in the church at Corinth and, and Paul chides them. I'm, not, I'm going to show you what the outline was when we dealt with this, but I'm not going to preach through this passage today. We're going to go to the other passages, companion passages. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 13. As we think about the role of redemptive, corrective, Discipline in the church. There's a reason I have used those adjectives. We'll be looking at that. Paul said, it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or if an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. And then his final exhortation to them is a command. Purge the evil person from among you. What have we just read? We've just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. This is one of those places where there's a real practical application of the all-sufficiency of Scripture. The Scripture is very clear on what we should do and why we should do it. We'll be looking at that today. My prayer is that a couple of things will happen. Anytime we come to this, that we would be brokenhearted that one who has named the name of Christ, walked with us, served with us, has turned to go in such a manner. There's no, there's no malice here. It's brokenheartedness. But also that we would examine ourselves and say, now, how have we lived? Have we uh, contributed to this somehow by our, by our apathetic attitude? We're all covenanting members here. We've all agreed to some things. We'll see that next Sunday when we gather for the Lord's Supper. 
And so it should be a time of self-examination. The Scripture says to do that, examine yourself, whether you're in the faith. So I pray that this will be a very cleansing, sanctifying, strengthening, growing time for all of us. Thank you. Please be seated. The subject of church discipline is easily misunderstood. I've, I pastored a church uh, in Clinton, Louisiana that started in 1836. And, uh, and you read back through some of the things. And people, people will tell you the horror stories of discipline. And I talk in terms of, well, yeah, my great-grandfather was kicked out of the church for this. And you hear this kind of language. It's easily misunderstood. It's seen as judgmental. People will retreat to Matthew 7. Uh, judge not, yes, to be judged. For the judgment you judge, you shall be judged. That doesn't the Scripture teach don't judge. Folks, this is, this is being loving. It's being loving. You cannot have learning without both edges of discipline. Discipline is a two-edged sword. It's from the Latin word uh, disciplina, which, which we get our people from that. And here's what part of the problem is. Uh, there's formative and corrective discipline. Formative discipline goes on all the time. If you were in Sunday school this morning, you were engaged in some formative discipline. There was, there was positive instruction being set forth from the Scriptures. When, when you gather in here, we open the Word at this time. There's formative discipline. At home, when you had children growing up or you have children and you're teaching, that's formative. You're instructing, positive instruction. But there's also corrective discipline. If you want to know what's one of the things that's wrong with our schools today, there is no meaningful corrective discipline. You cannot educate in a climate where you only allow for formative discipline and you reject corrective discipline. Corrective discipline is redemptive correction. We use the Word of God for that. We say here that the Scriptures are inerrant, infallible, all sufficient. We just looked last Sunday night in our going through the Scriptures, seeing Jesus in the Scripture. We looked at 2 Timothy, where Paul says in chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, profitable. All Scriptures are profitable for teaching. There's your, there's your formative discipline. For reproof, that's, that can be formative and corrective. For correction, clearly corrective discipline. And for training in righteousness, formative really interesting, isn't it, how the Holy Spirit works. You want to get rid of formative or corrective discipline? In this passage, you've got to go through the front end of it, teaching, say it's not, not proper for teaching, reproof, get to correction, and then training in righteousness. You can't even come from the other end of it. The Scripture's brilliant in the way it, it encases those topics that are not popular, not pleasant. Paul said, Timothy, be instant in season, out of season. What, you know, that people, I hear people saying that means a whole lot of different things. But one of those is you teach and you preach when it's not pleasurable. This is not pleasurable for me. But it's right. It's right. And if it's right, we embrace it. Discipline is a vital mark of a true church. In fact, uh, John Dagg, I've quoted this to you before, who was the first Southern Baptist to write a, uh, a manual of systematic theology, and he wrote a two volume, was the second was the Manual of Church Order, says in his Manual of Church Order, it's been remarked that when discipline leaves a church, Christ goes with it. That when a church abandons the biblical command to practice church discipline, the, the Spirit of Christ does not dwell regnantly in, in power in that place. In fact, coming out of the Reformation, I think I told you this when we were studying the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, the uh, Reformers said that there were, th they said there were three sacraments. One was baptism, one was the Lord's Supper, and one was the practice of church discipline. And so that was one of the marks of a true church back then. What does a true church look like? If it doesn't practice that, then they would not call it a true church. So I'm thankful to God that the leadership here, when we were rewriting our Constitution and bylaws, was willing to search the Scriptures and discover what it has to say on this, and it's, and it's written into our Constitution and bylaws. One of the best uh, sections you'll find in any church's Constitution and bylaws. When I preached on this passage before, I'll just give you the skeleton outline because we're not going to preach on the passage today. We're going somewhere else. I showed you that there were six areas that Paul addresses in these 13 verses. They were the absolutely scandalous situation in the church, 
the atrocious attitude of the church about that, the apostolic charge to carry out church discipline by the apostle, the awful leavening influence of unchallenged sin, the application of Christ's death to congregational integrity. When he says, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed, it's a pretty strong appeal to a church. And then finally, the actions of Christ's followers relative to the ungodly. Where we don't, we don't back completely away from the culture. We, we, love, we love our immoral neighbor. We love our ungodly neighbor. But we have no jurisdiction or authority over them to correct their sin. The gospel must do that. But when it comes to church members who have become members by saying, I have trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I am following him as his disciple. You hear us say this every time we stand in the waters of baptism. Is it your intention to follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life? Yes. And in following Christ, we live a life repenting of our sins, forgiving others who sin against us, enlarging our faith in the wonder and beauty of Christ. And when a lifestyle takes a turn, habitually neglecting those things, then that person is sinning, and the Scripture sends up warning signs at every turn. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses, uh, we're going to read verse, uh, I'll jump in here. Pick up in verse five, four, pardon me. He says, I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. He's writing about this letter here, 1 Corinthians 5. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. They did practice what Paul said. And he repented, notice, so that you should return, you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. You see, for Paul, 1 Corinthians 5 was not only a call to try to rescue the erring brother to take away the, 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 his sullying the name of Christ in that church, but it was also to see do they really mean it when they say it is the all-sufficient Word of God. Are they willing to obey the Scriptures? Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul points out there that, that to fail, in 1 Corinthians 5, to fail to practice discipline then you have been outwitted by the devil. He has sown something in your 11 in your congregation that will ruin it. But also to practice discipline and the person repent. And that's our prayer. That's our earnest prayer. That's why we're doing what we're doing here. Is that God would, would look upon us. Remember when I told you years ago about a situation? And we came studying in Mark. And the men brought that paralyzed man to Jesus. His friends brought him to Jesus, dropped him down from the roof after they tore a hole in the roof into the courtyard. Jesus is teaching. And there, Jesus looks at the man. Scripture says, he saw the faith of his friends and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Now they had brought him there to be healed. They had a lot of confidence in Jesus. I'm quite sure they were not disappointed that he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus went on to say, which is easier? So I don't know you're saying on yourself, who can forgive sins except God? So let me ask you, which is easier? To say your sins say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, the man on the, on the mat, rise, take up your bed, and walk. He was, Here's what we're doing. When we have a, a member who once was a, what, the, what John Bunyan calls in Pilgrim's Progress, a fair, flourishing believer among us, up a, a lifestyle, a, a turning away from the Lord, turning away from the Lord's people, going into a, a situation that this person's friends, fellow associates, all know this is going on. You just drop that person in the front of Jesus and say, dear God, please. 
Rescuer. And if you do not see in her a heart that's broken yet, then look at us. He saw the faith of the man's friends. Look at us, Lord. We believe. We believe your word. We believe you can. And we're dropping her before you. Forgive her. Bring her to repentance. Cleansing. Renewal. That's what we're doing. So in our Constitution and bylaws, in, in the section uh, 6.5 of the bylaws, under the discipline of members, it says that church discipline was, was clearly a part of church life. It served to maintain unity, purity, faithfulness in the early church. We acknowledge in there that there needs to be a return to that in our day. As, as Norman said, you won't find one church in ten, probably not five churches in a hundred, maybe one church in a hundred, that believes in this and practices this. Though every one of them would say, oh, we believe the Bible now, I believe the Bible. From God. And they wink at sin in their membership, and they wink at sin in their family members who are members of the church. And they do it all in the name of love. And I tell you, that's not love. It's a selfish insulation that I don't want to get my hands dirty. I've heard them all, brothers and sisters, I've heard it all over 40 plus years of pastoring. And it's all noise because it does not line up with the word. So today, I want to just address to you, begin addressing, we'll deal with this next week. I don't know how far God will let us go, but if it takes the week following, we're going we're gonna to hammer this out so that you can intelligently act. And in that meantime, I do... I hope you won't walk out of here today and say, well, I wasn't expecting that. I hope it will grip your heart to pray, to pray earnestly. Lord, come. Move. Rescue. Recover. Save. In the section 6.5.1 on the purpose of church discipline or discipline members, we give you 11 in our Constitution and Bylaws. I was telling Norman earlier when this, the materials I've read through the years, the Westminster Confession has, I think, five uh, purposes. Uh, I think Daniel Ray's book, which I've commended to you before on, on biblical church discipline, I think has six. Our Constitution and Bylaws cites 11. Let's go through those. First of all, to glorify God by obedience to his instructions. Whatever you do, eating, drinking, Worshiping, studying, acting, do all to the glory of God, Scripture says. So Matthew 18, 15, which we read, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. That's in private matters. That's private matters of discipline. When someone steps into the arena of public scandalous sin, like taking in a partner to live with them or going to live with a partner who's not your spouse, that's public. That's before the eyes of the world to see. And so 1 Corinthians 5 is the action there. But this does speak to taking action. 2 Corinthians 2, 9, For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. We're to glorify God. The glory of God is on this congregation. And you read in the Scriptures that when God was displeased with Israel, one of the old prophets wrote across the doors of the temple, Ichabod, Ichabod is what you pronounce, the glory has departed. If we don't want the glory of God to leave this place, then we take the steps necessary to demonstrate that we believe being saved makes a difference. Everything changes when you're saved. And John says in 1 John, you don't sin successfully when you're saved. That means you don't sin. That means when you do, you, you're gripped to repent. Seek forgiveness, cleansing, anew and afresh. Secondly, to restore repentant believers. The glory of God is first and foremost. To restore repentant believers. Look at Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. When someone has been overtaken... And this person has been overtaken. I've had conversations with her. Uh, they're not pleasant conversations. 
Uh, but I simply, and I can tell you this, but God is my witness. I speak in a very clear, straightforward, normal tone, citing scripture. And that typically, by the way, if you're not familiar with typically provokes somebody to anger if, they're, if they know that they're sinning against the scriptures. But there have been several conversations. Warning what this path will take you to if you don't turn, return back to God. And so we're to restore. And my prayer is, I don't, I don't know if you have any connections with this individual at all or not. If you're interested in reaching out and contacting you, let me know. We'll give you ways to do that. To say we're praying for you, we love you, we miss you. But here's the deal. If that hasn't been happening over weeks and months, then we need to repent. Ask God to help us to love more. We pledge in our covenant to watch over one another in Christian love, brotherly love. Faithfully warn and exhort one another as occasion may require. We need to be sure that we're, we don't get ensnared in this. Third, to sanctify the Lord's Supper. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. You don't approach this thing lightly. If this individual were to come into our setting next Sunday, which would be wonderful, by the way, I would forbid her to take the juice or the bread because I would not want to tempt the Lord to kill her. You say, well, my God doesn't do that. You better get into the Scriptures then because the God of the Scriptures does that. He doesn't take these things lightly. Fourth, to purify the spirit and message of the church. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your boasting is not good. And I would say neither is, neither is apathy or complacency. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? When I first came here and was teaching on this, it's been 12 years ago now, that, that I was teaching on something like this. There's a family here whose son had impregnated two different girls in high school. The young man came to me. He was a high school student. To be all excited. I'm going to be a daddy. I said, really? Tell me about that. I said, you're not, a, you're not a husband yet. I said, you know what the scripture calls that? It's fornication. Well, he was shocked. I wouldn't rejoice with him. And his parents said, well, we're not hanging around a church that does this. And so they took this boy, and after he left, a different young lady became pregnant out of wedlock. God being my helper, we're not going to unleash that on the world, brothers and sisters. We're going to hold up a standard of holiness and righteousness and repent and forgive, but not play fast and loose with those kind of things. Number five, to deny Satan any advantage in the church. 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. In Ephesians 4.27, give no opportunity to the devil. Six, to prove the leader's love and care. And I already read uh, another passage. This is a companion passage, 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 12. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. See what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent of the matter. So also, although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the one who did the wrong, nor for the sake of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your earnestness for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. That's the attitude. That's the hard attitude you have. Yes, taking this action will be grievous if this person does not repent first. But it's not taken to punish. It's not taken to wipe our hands. It's taken to provoke to a grief that will produce a godly sorrow that will bring real lasting change. Seven, to deter others from sin. First Corinthians, 1 Timothy 5.20. 
As for those who persist in sin, this is, this, these kind of times in a congregation should send a warning sign. Those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. That's the biblical principle that the others may hear in fear. You read that in the Old Testament all the time. Eight, to destroy fleshly lusts in a believer. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. You're to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This, this practice of excommunication, which is where we're going, is designed for the fleshly lust to be destroyed and the spirit saved and rescued. Number nine, to cut emotional ties with unrepentant Christians. 1 Corinthians 5.11, I'm writing not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. We simply cannot carry on, and we do, and we do not do this in our home, by the way, not carry on as if everything's okay. Anytime I'm around this individual, they know everything's not okay. It's not okay. Number 10, to protect Scripture from perversion and error, Titus 1, 10 to 14. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. There's, there's this protecting the integrity of the Scriptures. When we say here that we believe the Scriptures, but yet we might wink at the things like we're talking about today, then we can be guilty of the charge we don't believe the Scriptures. It's a prop. It's not a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Number 11, to shame a brother or sister to repentance. 2 Thessalonians 3.14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person. That's what we're doing here today. Have nothing to do with them, that they may be ashamed. Not ashamed as an end in itself, but, but brought to feel shame for conduct that would bring them to repentance. Now, real quickly, I want to say, and we're going to close, and we'll pick this up next Sunday, Lord willing. Church discipline is necessary when biblical love is violated by a serious private offense. This is all from our Constitution and bylaws, by the way. Second, biblical unity is violated by those who form divisive factions which destroy the peace of the church. Third, biblical standards are violated by those living scandalous lives. Fourth, biblical truth is violated by those who reject essential doctrines of the faith. Obviously, we're here because of number three. But all four are realistic context in which church discipline could and should be exercised. What is the answer to all this? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's believing the gospel. It's every day getting up saying, Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and to rise from the grave, proving that he did just that very thing. And Lord, help me today not to get familiar with sin. Folks, John Owen said it, the great Puritan said, he said, while it is true that God has promised to forgive all who repent, Nowhere has God promised to give repentance to all who sin. You never know that the next step, person, I don't believe this person for a moment, came to a point and said, ah, to heck with it all. I talked with her. She said, Daddy, don't I deserve to be happy? Ah, oh, the devilish lure the devilish lure. It was one step. And probably the enemy of our souls was saying, you know, you can be forgiven of sin. Grace forgives you of sin. And then one step turned to another and another and another. And you get to a point where you don't even want to look back. The gospel, folks. Preach it to yourself every day. Pray it for others every day. Brothers and sisters, I want, I want to die in my sleep before I wake up any morning 
believing I've outgrown the gospel. I need it today as much as I ever have. And you do too. And if you're not aware of that, then I promise you, you're on a slope that's being greased by the enemy of your soul who would love nothing better than to do what he always does, to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we approach this with the hope of the gospel. Lord, guard my heart. I don't want folks to ever have to gather and deal with me in this way. I don't want to ever have to gather to deal with any of you this way. And yet here we are on behalf of one who was named among us, who you and I called sister, with whom we fellowshiped. So pray. Pray for the power of the gospel to grow in your life and my life more than it ever has and pray for the power of the gospel to do its rescuing work. We're in a culture, I don't tell you this, we're in a culture that applauds the lifestyle that we're dealing with today. That thinks it's wonderful. Isn't it great that so-and-so's found so-and-so? Inside Hollywood, access Hollywood. So-and-so and so-and-so, they've been, they're going to have a baby. Oh, they're just so excited. Brothers and sisters, we're in a culture that is going to hell as quickly as it can. We better be about the business of rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. I'm counting on you to do that. I'm counting on you to pray, to plead, to cry out before God. But know this, we are resolved here to use every means God has given us to maintain his glory, to recover repentant sinners, and make the lordship of Jesus Christ over this congregation mean what it should mean biblically. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We don't have to grope in darkness wondering, standing around, well, what would Jesus do? You've given it to us clearly. And help us to cling to the cross of Christ. Help us to, to say, this word is sufficient for this challenge. And then, Lord, grant us the collective desires of our hearts to see this wanderer Come home. This prodigal return. We go forth weeping today, Lord, bearing precious gospel seed. And we long to be able to come back rejoicing, bearing the fruit of that gospel seed with us. We give this to you. Walk us through it by your spirit. Help us to guard our own hearts. Examine ourselves to your glory the Lordship of Christ here, the good of the erring sister, and the well-being of all in this church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.